Today's event is our CISO panel with a topic on how working from home is changing the business environment. To our left, we have Nibin Philip, Global CISO for Landry's Inc. Nibin is responsible for the information security of concepts under Landry's Inc. and Fertitta Entertainment Inc., including multiple restaurant brands, hotels, Golden Nuggets, casinos, and the Houston Rockets. Nibin served in multiple IT security roles during the last 10 years and holds a master's degree in cybersecurity and information insurance. Welcome, Nibin Philip, to our panel. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. Uh, next, we have Maury Haber, CTO and CISO for Beyond Trust. Maury has more than 25 years of IT industry experience, author books on privilege attack vectors, asset attack vectors, and identity attack vectors. Maury currently oversees Beyond Trust strategy for privileged access management and remote access solutions. In 2004, he joined EI as Director of Security Engineering and was responsible for strategic business discussions and vulnerability management architectures in Fortune 500 clients. Prior to EI, he was Development Manager for Computer Associates, Inc., responsible for new product data cycles and named customer accounts. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Welcome, Maury Haber, to our panel. Great to have you. Thank you very much. In the middle, we have Darren Rose, currently a CTO and CISO advisor. Darren is an experienced technology executive with over 25 years in the identity management and security industry, serving at Tivoli Systems, IBM, Waveset Technology, Sun Microsystems. Most recently, Darren spent 12 years as a CTO and CISO at Sailpoint Technologies, leading the company's technology strategy, internal security and compliance. Throughout his career, Mr. Rose, help design, build, and develop innovative groundbreaking technology solutions that have shaped the identity and access management industry. Today, Mr. Rose is an independent advisor working with vendors and customers on designing and delivering the next generation of IM solutions. In 2020, Mr. Rose was awarded the title of Research Fellow, a frequent contributor to IM standards at OASIS, the W3C, IETF, speaks frequently at industry events about IM technology security solutions, and has also co-authored the book on identity attack vectors, implementing an effective identity and access management solution. Welcome, Darren Rose, to the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, to the right of Darren, we have uh, John Mazzarini, a global CISO of Millicom Telecom International. John is responsible for all aspects of the global information security program, including security operations, engineering, architecture, vulnerability, risk management, and business continuity planning. John is a 25-year veteran providing information and corporate security services to multinational Fortune 1000 companies. As an industry-recognized leader, his expertise across multiple business verticals provides for a unique approach to delivering information risk program that drives business-focused solutions to today's global information security and compliance challenges. John is the author of the award-winning Chronicles of the CISO blog where he shares insight and recommendations based on his decades of experience in the security industry. Welcome, John Mazzarini, to our panel. Great to have you. Thanks for having me, Ronaldo. Great to be here. To our right, we have Diego Fonseca de Souza, currently Executive Director and Global Deputy CISO to Cummings Inc. Diego is a strategic thought leader of debt at safeguarding the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of company data, information systems, and operational technology. He has a proven aptitude for aligning cybersecurity hardware, software, and policies with a corporate strategy, skilled at planning, delivering, and managing global information security initiatives designed to thwart internal and external threats. Diego is a collaborative team mentor with the ability to build the best talent and inspire people through his leadership. Diego started his career at Head Techno as a network administrator, joined INPE, which is the Brazilian government department working on the network security and providing incident response security management. In Brazil, Diego led the IT department in South America as an IT manager for Dresser Business, later joined GE Oil and Gas as senior director responsible for leading the global IT security teams in charge of driving efforts to maintain security controls. He then became managing director for United Airlines responsible for United's global core security technologies, where he focused on developing world-class security strategies and standards across technology and digital organization. Welcome, Diego Fonseca Souza to our panel. Great to have you. Thank you, Renan. Glad to be here. Last but certainly not least, uh, we have Chuck Peters moderating our CISO panel for tonight. 
Chuck is the regional director for CSMP and Dallas chapter president. In his free time, Chuck is a senior cloud security engineer at USAA. He lives in Dallas, Texas, and has worked in technology, cloud security, and is servant leadership for 20 years. He believes that the mission of our generation is to secure the internet, and he lives that mission every day. Thank you, Chuck, and welcome to our panel. I will now hand it off to you. Thank you, Reynaldo. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure to have the privilege to uh, serve as moderator for this panel. Um, I want to talk just a minute for the context in which we brought this panel together. So due to the COVID pandemic, organizations across the United States and across the world have had to fundamentally change the way that they interact with their employees. What I find very fascinating about this is that the context of that interaction has a huge impact on cybersecurity. What we see is the perimeter of our organizations move from where they could be controlled in offices, in multinational locations where everyone was uh, within a certain space to now people working from home, working from coffee shops, uh, basically distributing the, the threat across all types of different trusted and untrusted networks. This panel, Ronaldo has pulled this panel together to help us gain perspective from these various CISOs so they can share their thoughts about how working from home is changing their business environments. Um, so I would like to go straight into some of the questions that we've prepared for the CISOs. Um, the, so the format of this, uh, of this panel will proceed in the following way. Um, I will address a question. Each of you will have two minutes to answer that question. If you go over time, you will hear a, uh, a little ding like this. Um, if you hear the ding, please wrap up your comments and then we'll move on to, uh, to the next speaker. Um, each question will have about six minutes at the end of, of six questions. Uh, we will proceed uh, to, uh, uh, to the end of our program. I would encourage that the attendees please use the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. If you don't know where that is, if you look along the bottom of your, your toolbar, you'll see a, uh, a little icon that says Q&A with two little dialog boxes on it. Um, that way we can actually um, get some questions from you and maybe make this event just a little bit more interactive. So uh, on to the questions. So question number one, uh, this question is directed at Maury Haber and Diego. Uh, cyber criminals are capitalizing on human emotional states and vulnerabilities to execute attacks both at home, at work, and on the go, especially uh, with the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. As a result, the act of social engineering empowers these threat actors to have greater success on, with their cyber attacks. In general, how can organizations work towards improving cyber hygiene across their uh, uh, across the, their set of employees? So, uh, Maury, I would like to pass the microphone to you. Thank you, Chuck. First, we have to really understand the problem. We are working from home for the most part. Some organizations have let people go back to the office, but many of them are not even full time. When we're home, we tend to be more relaxed. We're sharing space with potentially our loved ones who are also working from home, kids, animals. And as we started this presentation, we were joking, you know, hey, I have a jacket and a shirt on, but I am in board shorts. I, I am more relaxed. So I answer emails in basically my night clothes, pajamas. With that, we've let our guard down. So we're more inapt to basically fall for a social engineering attack via email or something else. We want to know more information about COVID. We want to learn things about the state of what's going on. And a well-crafted email, a good targeted email, uh, unfortunately has worked in uh, compromising individuals. But we have to take it one step further. We're also dealing with ESD, election stress disorder. And many people are experiencing that today. I can say for myself, I haven't had good sleep in several weeks, one way or another. And many of my friends and relatives are in the same experience, not because it's a political type atmosphere, but just because of the stress of the election, worried about social unrest, and then you add the pandemic on top of it. We've let our dad guard down even further. We've experienced, at least in my organization, targeted phishing attacks 
talking about different types of election problems and things like that, that are pure phishing attacks, including voice phishing attacks, talking about problems at a local precinct. Locally here in Central Florida, we even had a middle school shut down during polling due to an incident and emails flying around from various places on Nextdoor and other places that I get on the same computer that I get work email. Tempting target to open, but also potentially malicious as well. So we understand the problem. We're more comfortable, we're thriving for information, and we're already in a compromised state. So organizations really need to work to take the best disciplines that we've learned in the office in terms of security, low, uh, admin rights, removing admin rights, and postures like keeping things up to date from vulnerability and patch management to ensure that these types of attacks do not compromise an individual, especially when the human factor is at stake. And I'm gonna thank Chuck for not necessarily dinging me because the last thing I want is a muted microphone during this type of discussion. <laughs> you need to well pass it over to you. Uh, you did great. So I just wanna add a couple of stuff here. I believe when we think about hygiene, uh, First of all, we are dealing with, as you just mentioned, something that's it's new, but it's not net new, right? So working from home has been there for quite some time. We are just expanding it exponentially right now, moving very fast. I think we need to make sure when we give the when we empower our users to work from home, and in this case, in this case, we are bringing. They're, they are bringing their own devices or they are bringing their own network to the work environment. Uh, we need to, to enhance our awareness campaigns. So we need to educate our employees and how they should be dealing. So for instance, uh, here at my organization, we decided to re reveal the acceptance usage policy because now we have a totally different environment. It, it's different than providing a company device, then the employee now using their printers, using their uh, internet providers, or we don't know the secure configuration of their routers and Wi-Fi. So we have to change the policy, how they should deal with our information. So revisiting the policy maybe is the first thing you should be looking. Uh, awareness and campaign to your employees, make sure you educate them in terms of how they should be dealing with the data, how they should be dealing with uh, with the systems and how they connect enforcing VPN connections. For example, it's mandatory. If you want to connect and do something, just use VPN as a uh, cyber guidance, let me put it this way. And uh, on the technology side, so take a look, what are the, what are the technologies that you, you are using in your environment, right? So do you have the right secure postures in place, right? So your employees need VPN access to connect to your network. They use MFA authentication. So, do you have proper monitoring in place? So I think there are some uh, key steps on the hygiene process you need to take in place so you can avoid and minimize the risk of your employees being attacked to a social engineering and then fall into a trap. Fantastic. I'd really like to key in on something that you said about, uh, uh, about educating your employees. Um, often in cybersecurity, we hear that the weakest link in any cyber chain is uh, the human factor. I was wondering, uh, Maury, if you might have any uh, any follow up on on cyber education and how how to implement it or or how to to actually get people to practice it. Cyber education traditionally was done once a year, and that's wrong. It's just not a good way to do it getting your organization to think about the education in a continuous manner for all employees at what's what works. We find that simple things like sending out newsletters doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna get read, but doing things like uh, continuous fish, phishing or testing and other types of educational uh, models do work very, very well. And basically using your daily town hall meetings to ask questions, to make people think, to uh, spark awareness goes a lot more than just education as well. I mean, from a, a simple instance, we do a monthly company update. We bring all of our company employees together, a thousand of them, and we dedicate a few slides to it to just talk about cyber. But that's got to be something that's built into your culture. That's got to be something that you can get management to buy in. 
because it's more than just that once a year training. And that's really critical to make people aware of really what's going on in the world and what can potentially impact people working from home or in the office. Fantastic. I really like uh, the culture of cyber mindfulness. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fantastic point. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our next question. So uh, Darren and John, this question is for you. Uh, with many more users moving from an on-premises workplace to an at-home workplace, security professionals need to extend security beyond the perimeter to include their household. This exposes organization to novel risks and new attack vectors. What advice would best serve security teams to address concerns for remote workers while they are protecting IT assets and data? Uh, so, so maybe I'll jump, I'll jump in first. Yes, yes, please do. Yeah, so um, I think it's really going to a, a common theme for this evening is going to be about training, of course, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but I think it is interesting to consider that the attack vector is now the rest of the family and potentially it's your refrigerator, you know, kind of a strange thought or your nest or your IOT devices that sit around you. Um, the corporate uh, ecosystem is now the home environment um, uh, and that is um, something of considerable concern so it is about education so to the family right let's educate everybody um, I love it when um, a corporate you know uh, no before or a wombat or some sort of you know formalized uh, cyber security training is made freely available to the rest of the family anybody else that wants to take it so I think that's a um, a great point, but I think it's also about network uh, topology and security as well. So I'm a big fan of actually giving staff basic home network security recommendations. Um, you know, it's amazing how many people don't have a router that they manage themselves. Um, just having a second router behind your um, internet service provider, you know, don't just have it on the edge is a huge advantage and in fact going one further from that I mean I advocate separating you know the kids and their friends and the fridge and the nest the, the refrigerator and the nest and all that stuff from uh, the actual um, work computer right so a bit of a bit of network isolation um, takes on a, a new meaning here and I think to extend that even further I'm again an advocate of the idea that executives company executives uh, this panel uh, you're the first guys I'm going to chase after, right? Uh, you, you're the best target for my attack if I'm an adversary. So I personally believe that executives home networking should become part of the um, corporate umbrella. Um, and there should be some degree of ownership or at least if not recommendations and resources uh, available uh, for those guys. Because the, you know, your home is now um, the network. So the, uh, the, the corporate network. So we have to, we have to extend basically. That would be my Okay, fantastic. Topology. I like that a lot. John, uh, what, about, what do you think? Yeah, and uh, as Darren alluded to, right, this is going to, you know, most of this night is probably going to focus on, on education and awareness. Um, you know, and just tying back to some of the stuff he, he mentioned, you know, we, we do a, a very regular, you know, awareness or, you know, um, education kind of campaign with our employees. And it's a lot of different things. It, yes, it's around, being aware uh, of your, your, you know, what's going on in your world, you know, the, the nest, the Google homes and all that kind of stuff, absolutely. Um, but it's also trying to get them to understand this black box that they have in their house that was given to them by, you know, the cable company. And they occasionally need to do updates um, or, or figure out to your point, you know, how, how it's configured, how the networks are se se separated um, to ensure to ensure that. Um, so one of the things that I'll tell you we saw very quickly when, when all this stuff happened is kind of the the dissolving uh, the dissolving work day, right? So you know we have monitors and, and you know alerts in, in place that kind of alert us to when people who are working out of time, you know why they're logging into the systems at midnight and all that kind of stuff. Well, that became the norm very quickly, right? So, you know, some of our internal things that we were using 
really we had to we had to kind of take a step back and go, okay, it, you know, does it really give us what we're what we're looking for? So there was certainly some introspection on our side when you know all of a sudden the alerts started popping for you know what we thought was you know a great concept, but in practice when everyone's working, you know, if they're spending four hours helping their kids do schoolwork during a day. Well, yeah, they're working eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night um, just to get the, the, the job done. So, you know, understanding that. Um, a couple of the other lessons learned, I guess, that when we went through this is, um, you know, it just, your technology needs to be configured correctly, right? VPNs, are you using cloud? Are you not using cloud? How you're getting your patches and your passwords changed? So there's a lot of complexity around just shipping people home and things you have to worry about from the security side. Fantastic. I really, I really like what you were saying about um, the change to normalized behavior, right? Like if you use normalized behavior to, um, uh, to create your alert and monitoring landscape, and then everything changes about what's normal about behavior, uh, it, it can make your entire system kind of go haywire. That's exactly fantastic observation. Um, I want to, I want to pass it back to, uh, to Darren and ask you, Darren, you know, um, what you talked a lot about, about, you know, um, giving, uh, bringing executives into the, the topology of, of the network, bringing the executive workspace into the topology of the network. Um, I really like that, but I, I, I wonder how that, how that happens. Like, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, most uh, executives aren't security professionals in any way, shape or form, even if they are, you know, in security in one form or another, if you're part of a security company, just some simple things like make a make a, a router recommendation, you know, and uh, something that's running, you know, tomato, something that's running the right um, operate, you know, if, if almost say if your if your router is blue with two aerials on it, throw it out, um, you know, buy one of these. Um, <laughs> you know buy one of these uh, reasonable and to, and and um to john's point you know update the thing and so a lot of it is just basic recommendations and okay so we can own the ceo's laptop there's no question there right i mean the ceo is working from home with my equipment that i can put uh, agent tree and control on um but like i said it's it's the family or it's the neighbor that comes over and gets on the network i mean if you don't have a basic third party javascript blocker in your browser 50 50 you're going to get owned and so you know it's a kind of it, being aware that that environment is dangerous and and having to um you know do the effort to take control of it is is just sort of basic it's now you know it's the ciso's problem as well now right that's interesting it become it becomes just a fundamental part of what has to be done Right. Be, you know, getting owned is not good for anybody, right? Whether you, however it happened. So, you know, th this is a significant vector we've reopened. And so we've got to get control over it. There's just, you know, no two ways around it. Fantastic. Right. The, um, oh, okay. I could, I could go on forever. I got to move on. Mm. All right. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and move on to question three. Uh, question three, this is for you, Maury, and for you, Niven. So uh, to date, Organizations have faced unfortunate cyber breach breaches that led to high costs and impacts on brand reputation. This could be related to creating security principles versus applying security practices, relative in relatively insecure software applications, or engaging in reactive versus proactive security measures. The COVID pandemic may further reinforce these issues uh, uh, by enabling more sophisticated attackers. So, what would be an effective approach to address these concerns in a strategic way that helps organizations become more secure in the short and in the long term? Maybe why don't you jump on this one first? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Murray. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of the organization faced uh, challenges during the initial stages or phases of the pandemic uh, where organizations had to roll out solution for the remote workers within small time period to accommodate remote workers as well as to sustain the business. Uh, by having team members working from home, the attack surface has increased. And uh, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, organizations are 
security team should identify the attack surface as it, it has increased and apply the appropriate control. Uh, so limiting access as much as possible is very important as there is time factor involved in this. When there is limited time available to roll out a product, there's always a temptation to cut the corners, right? So things like zero trust uh, approaches like that could be implemented to protect the assets and data. You know, lateral movement can be stopped even if a threat actor gets access to system. Again, you know, we discussed about cybersecurity awareness that's very much needed. Also, you know, solutions like multi-factor is extremely important and it can help a lot to address the issue of poor password management, things of that nature. Uh, first of all, an organization should be able to identify high critical assets and the risk associated with them. And having visibility is very critical as we can uh, protect only the assets that we know. So the short-term plan can be a plan where uh, the focus get applied to high critical assets and risk associated with them. Um, the thing that changed with the whole work from home environment is the change in attack surface, like I mentioned before. Any best practices that we followed in the past still applies, uh, or we need to add more, right? Maybe an initial focus need to be given to the changes that happen after the work from home shift and organizations might have had better controls if the employees are on premise, like we discussed before versus being remote. So some of those priorities needs to be readjusted so that proper attention uh, can be given to the moving targets and long-term plan can be created by aligning with the uh, business objectives or needs. Maury? I, I fully agree with Nibin's answer. Um, I'd like to consider the, the best strategic way to start with security basics, and that's at the asset inventory level. We've seen a lot of shift of assets to home environments, not only potentially laptops, but other equipment that's had to move home in order for people to effectively do their jobs. With that in mind, once you know your asset inventory and how it's shifted, then to Nibin's point, look at that critical risk, look where the risks lie. Uh, I personally do not like BYOD devices to access corporate uh, information. Granted, you have phones and mobile devices, but someone using their home computer with corporate VPN software is just a risk, it's too high of a risk. It's an opportunity for a threat actor to really cause some damage on the network, no matter what you do. So understanding the devices that have moved home, making sure that they're corporate owned, and then finally revisiting the security stack for those devices. If they're a typical Windows or Mac endpoint, what is your security stack? Are you, you obviously have malware, but have you invested in solutions for removing admin rights, uh, application control? Um, have you done things like an EDR or MDR or web proxy? Revisiting your security stack and then look at how they're being managed. Do they need VPN in order to get updates or gather logs? Can I shift to the cloud so that as soon as the device is turned on, uh, it's getting its updates, it's sending its data, it's not saturating my VPN pipes. And then finally, if you have you know, heavy dependency on on-premise applications or technologies like VPN, there are better ways to do remote access to the cloud or on-premise where you don't have to extend the network layer. You, you can actually extend the application and, and using various bastion host type technologies. So I really believe it starts with the security basics of knowing how the environment has changed and who the risks are, and then revisiting the security stack to address them. Oh, that's, that's really cool, because that hits on a place that's very close to my heart um, as a cloud DevSecOps engineer, which is the Beyond Corp model from Google, which is that there is no such thing as a, uh, as a trusted network, right? Mm -hmm. It is all extensions of applications. Um, Nib and I would love to hear uh, what you what you think of of the. Uh, do you think that trusted networks are are becoming obsolete? Sorry, what was the question again? Sorry. Oh, I apologize. Uh, there's there's chatter that sometimes um, maybe trusted networks are not the best uh, way to extend perimeters for organizations. And as somebody who you know grew up in the cloud. There's, there's rumors that trusted networks are actually obsolete ways to manage uh, security. And I just thought maybe you maybe you might have an opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, it could go both ways. I mean, sometimes we could consider a trusted network and move forward with that. We might have 
proper controls in the, the trusted networks already available. And there's always situations where uh, other, when we bring in other networks, we don't have proper controls enabled. So I think it could go in both direction, depending upon the situation from a security perspective, uh, is you, there's opinions that you know trusted network is probably not the great idea because um, you know there's always a chance of deception and that could occur in a trusted network as well. Chuck, I think you're on mute. I'm muted. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> God, every time, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. bell. We, 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 we were dinging the bell on you there, buddy. We were dinging the bell yeah, on just, you there. Just unmuting you. <laughs> if I can get through one Zoom without make, messing up the Zoom button, that would be a good day. Where were we? We were on question four. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, reasonable approach. Okay, yes. Yes, we are on question number four. Okay, so this question is for Darren and Diego. So uh, here we go. With the COVID pandemic affecting many organizations across the world, whether big or small, more people are working remotely. As a result, there appears to be a shift in how security is provisioned on new assets or deprovisioned on returned company assets. Whether it is people leaving an organization, joining a new one, obtaining or leaving assets, what would be the best or most reasonable approach to sanitize returned equipment and then ship it out to new users. Charlie, that's a tough one. Burn it. <laughs> Start again. It's like uh, that um, works. <laughs> that was a good yeah. one. <laughs> Let's get radical. In fact, actually, I, I do recall when one time there was a problem with the TPM, with the Trusted Platform Module, and a government agency that will remain unna will remain nameless uh, actually did burn twenty thousand laptops. Um, so you know, pretty radical stuff. But um, no, I, I think uh, uh, before we talk about how to sanitize, let's talk about that provisioning process because provisioning is both soft and hard, right? It's soft assets um, in terms of all the accounts and privileges that we give out to people, and it's about the, the you know the hard assets, the laptops. Um, I think if I, you know, I'm, I'm with I'm with Mari really that that BYOD BYOD is just super hard. Um, it's very hard to trust um, the stack when the endpoint is 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 compromised. If if the host, the endpoint, the laptop is compromised, there's there's very little you can do, right? I mean, even if you have a strong single sign-on layer, you have good um, uh, visibility and behavioral uh, awareness and analysis. Um, yeah, it's kind of all game, all the bets are off. So it's just kind of hard. So most of us have really um, come down on, on that spot, but it's actually all pretty hard to implement that. If you've gone big on SaaS applications and you're big in the cloud, um, you know, it's actually, you've got to take a very, very deliberate um, act. You've either got to push people through the VPN and then on ingress to the VPN, you can look at posture and basically say, hey, that's not my device or that's not a, a BYOD that has my agent tree on it, right? Or you have to use something like a CASB, you know, Cloud Access Security Broker, to basically redirect the traffic. So I come from my dirty laptop and I go to my nice clean corporate um, SaaS application um, and either the application or the CASB pushes me back to say, hey, you know, is this, whose device is this? So there's things we can do, but we have to be very proactive um on on that side of it and, and i'll sort of finish on this notion of join a move a lever it's something that we've talked about in identity management forever and you know mari and i being well, myself an ex-vendor in that space but um it really is around having good control life cycles over the joining the moving and the leaving of people and it doesn't matter what you're going to do to scrub that laptop if you don't know the person's been fired you don't collect the assets, right? So very, very good connections to your um, HR and source of truth for identities, and then good control processes around managing the de deprovisioning and offboarding process are, are, are basic good good corporate hygiene. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a great question and not easy to answer for sure. Uh, but I do agree with you, Darren. I think everything starts to 
make sure we understand that provisioning and deprovisioning assets is not a cybersecurity responsibility, it's a uh, IT business responsibility uh, aligned with HR uh, function. Making sure first that you have a clear policy that drives how you, you provision and deprovision assets to employees okay. and they understand within the new uh, the new style of work, which is the work from home, uh, they have they may have some penalties if they don't uh, if they don't like return the, the the assets to to the company. I have seen some organizations saying like like for example, if you leave the company and you don't return, you don't get your whatever payment. So until the assets there, so there are some legal stuff you can attach. But I think on top of that, looking from a cybersecurity angle, uh, uh, like more specifically, it's make sure you have asset management, right? When I say asset management is make sure you can, you can manage your device. If that device never returns home, so are you able to lock down, wipe out that device remotely, right? So make sure you have that control. So. I, I agree with Darren and Maury about the BYOD is hard to manage, but we need to understand something that's coming and it's not going away. We're gonna have to deal with that. I see more and more companies moving to that because it's also associated to cost uh, opportunity. So we as cyber leaders, we need to see, okay, if we are, I am not provisioning a business device and the employee will use their personal device, how do I ensure maybe I can build a container within their device where all the business data will be placed there, right? Um, it goes back to the trusted network before a little bit, right? So we don't trust anybody, right? It's zero trust approach. You need to make sure anybody, anything that connects to you, you are able to monitor, you are able to, to respond, you're able to protect. So I believe within this, this question on the provisioning, the provisioning, it's... It's really about the alignment of the cyber cyber team with the HR team and being able to manage the device remotely as well, if in case it never returns home. Terrific, that's terrific. Diego, I'd like to zoom in on something you were talking about um, regarding containerization on BYOD. Darren, I was wondering if you had any opinions uh, or experience or, or advice on, on that kind of evolving space. Yeah, I, I think if it's in, in two, two, two realms, right? I mean, fundamentally, if it's a laptop, um, uh, you know, uh, unified endpoint management um, isn't complex and is deployable at scale uh, these days. So I think the UEM is a kind of a mandate on either a Windows or a Mac um, environment to have. And then I think if it's across an iOS or an Android device, again, our, our um, unified endpoint management solutions today, which used to be you know, the MDM uh, part of that, the mobile device management, um, again, it, it's kind of, you just have to say, look, you can't get access to Salesforce. You can't get access to my Salesforce unless the container's there. I mean, it's just... You know, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's just, it's just too much risk. Um, it's just mm -hmm. not worth it. So the convenience, you know, can still be there. I'd love it. You pay for the device, but you have to carry with it my agent in effect. It's really what we're saying. Fantastic. Well, we have just a little bit of time left on this question. And I thought I would address a question from the audience. Um, this is open to anyone on the panel. Uh, do you think the concept of zero trust will be intensified and if so will this intensification itself introduce more risk due to the maturity level of zero trust i can take i can take that one and somebody else can jump in yes i believe it's gonna intensify so if anybody can tell me here where your perimeter starts and, it, and where it, it ends right so data for me is the new perimeter Right, no matter where your data flows, it's your perimeter, right? So you're with all the, the compliance and GDPR uh, out there, you need to make sure you control your data. So authentication as always well is at the new perimeter, right? So we're gonna have to deal with that. We are connecting more and more to different networks that we had never connected before. So making sure we have the ability uh, to address those risks. So make sure you you have a clear controls before anybody connecting to you. You validate, you verify, you monitor, you ask, you re-ask, 
three times if needed, like encryption, VPN, whatever, you put the technology in there. So it's gonna be important. So I, I do believe that it's gonna intensify, the risk is gonna increase, is, it is increasing right now. And we need to make sure that we put the right controls in place for, for this new world. Okay. Yeah, I mean, perimeter is gone, right? I don't think anybody here debates that, right? I love the thought, Diego, as you said, as the data plane, as a means of understanding the footprint, right? Um, and I think I, being an identity management person, I would say I, identity management is now the control plane. It's the only thing that ties it together, right? I've got 10 SaaS apps and five VPN connections. The only thing is the account control and authentication and authorization. So the data tells you where it is and the, authentic, the identity helps you control it. I love that. I love that. That is, oh God, I'm underlining that. Okay. Uh, all right, so on to question number five. Uh, this one is for you, John, and for Maury. Some organizations are moving to effective work remotely processes while others have struggled in one way or another. If a vaccine is found to fight the current pandemic, do you foresee any cybersecurity challenges that organizations will face when returning to work in an office setting while still incorporating safe social distancing? So, uh, yeah, without a doubt, right? So everything we just chatted about, um, uh, you know, my biggest fear is when, you know, all 25,000 folks decide to come back into the office with these you know, devices that have struggled to remain managed for the last year and a half, right? Call it a year, whenever it is. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of rely on, on our antivirus. We kind of rely on our patching processes, but kind of, as I mentioned before, if that end user doesn't fire up that VPN once in a while, so we can connect to our infrastructure to get those patches or, or to do those updates, they're never getting done, all right? And we can, we can beg and plead all we want, but at the end of the day, the user has to fire up that VPN to do the patching. If they choose to walk into the office, then whatever is running on that device is now in my infrastructure. So whatever perimeter does still exist, whatever controls I have there, completely useless when it's literally carried in by my employee. So, you know, there, there are a lot of concerns about when we do decide uh, to, to get back in. Um, you know, we, we've, we've kind of implemented some controls in our offices, uh, you know, around knowing when people connect and, and why they're there and tying some of that back to, um, you know, to, to, to some of the tracking mechanisms for a lot of different reasons. Um, but, you know, one of the main one is you know, right now people can walk into our office. They, they have the ability to use our office space. We encourage them not to, but we don't stop them. So, you know, we, we are hyper uh, uh, attentive when we get alerts that said, hey, an employee connected to the Wi-Fi. Great, why are they there? What are they doing? And, you know, it kind of elevates the level of the security operations team a little bit to go, okay, we need to be especially diligent now, just in case we see something. We see something, nobody's there, slightly different reaction than if we see something and someone walked in there for the first time in eight months. Right. The perspective John gives is incredibly important because you have to be up to measure who should be in the office and when. If we said a vaccine is available tomorrow, we already know 2% of the population can't take it because they're allergic to eggs. The vaccines, all of them today, are made with egg products. So 2% of the people can't take it because it would be life-threatening. Then you also have the consideration of people that are potentially as bad as it sounds, anti-vaxxers. They want the proof that this is not gonna be harmful. We also have the problem of distribution and worldwide distribution for organizations that are multinational. For example, Indonesia today is using an experimental Chinese vaccine throughout its population because the resort city of Bali is suffering tremendously without tourism. Their goal is to vaccinate everyone with an experimental drug so that they can reopen Bali. The repercussions are completely unknown. So if you consider people, 
knowing some can't take it, some won't take it, and multinational organizations, you have to filter out to exactly John's concern of who should be in the office, when they should be in the office, or if potentially they can never come back to the office because they have an egg allergy, they're immunocompromised, and all it would take would be one person, and then the business could potentially be liable for the infection. So I don't think the vaccine is the end-all, be-all solving problem here. There's a lot of other factors for global organizations and people in general that we're going to have to deal with as we try to get people back to the office. And remember, you know, remember that even on a, you know, a good day, vaccines are, what, 75% effective? So right. the assumption that you know, I have a little card that says I have the vaccine so I can come and go as I please is a complete misnomer, right? Yeah, so, I think current FDA guidelines are 50% effective or more. Exactly. So we definitely have a problem here. In fact, many organizations, including my own, are considering giving up real estate. Look, people are effective at home. Um, why do you have to loft, uh, lease such a big office space? Um, do something more convenient, more effective. Um, it's going to be an interesting dynamic. We will, I don't think we will ever get back to where we were. And if we do, it'll take quite a bit of time. That was actually going to be my follow-up. Uh, John, I, I want to right. you know. No, that's, it's perfect. You guys are going, you guys are, are, are two steps ahead of me. Uh, John, I wanted to know what you thought about what's changed forever. Well, um, yeah, I, I really, I, I would agree, right? There's, there's really, there's, there's a combination of, of concepts here, right? So why my company needs, you know, all this office space, that, that's a fantastic question. Now, we do run a lot of critical infrastructure, so we will always have something like that. But when I look at us here in headquarters, uh, I work from my, from my apartment, I work from the WeWork down the road, I can go into the office if I want. Um, the new lifestyle is work anywhere. Now, great, but we've spent the last 25 years building this you know, conceptual hardened network in this trusted environment that is literally in the, in the, in the course of 12 months just being shot to hell. So, you know, and it's, it, it's fundamentally changing how we need to approach what we do. And, and, you know, Darren said it earlier, I truly believe that access management is our last bastion, right? That That's where we need to get to. And, you know, part of that challenge is, I don't think our, our infrastructures and our, you know, system engineers, all that are comfortable yet with, with helping us build that kind of environment to where we can rely on a, on a, on a user access approach for control but we got to get there. Terrific. This is, this is a terrific discussion. Okay, so um, on to question number six. Um, Niven and Diego, this, uh, this one is for you. Um, here we go. Uh, in a general sense, the COVID pandemic has presented both obstacles and opportunities for organizations and individuals. For example, before COVID, there were already many cybersecurity jobs unable to be filled. Now, with COVID, it seems like there is a higher demand for cybersecurity professionals because attackers are consistently becoming more creative and organizations find they need specific skill sets uh, in cybersecurity. In many cases, budget cuts have impacted how organizations are able to fill these positions. And even if some markets are more adversely affected than others, there is still going to be a need for cyber no matter what. Since working remotely is becoming a trend, what do you see are ways to help attract new talent or retain top talent while keeping employees engaged? In other words, is there an opportunity for talent in this sort of new era that we're discovering? Okay, I'll take that uh, first, Diego. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. We are going through a phase where there's a high demand for cybersecurity professionals. And of course, cybersecurity professionals are seeing opportunities in, in other companies or companies are ready to pay more than you know they used to pay for cybersecurity professionals in the past, especially because of the current situation 
and especially because we are seeing a lot of attacks happening. So I think from my perspective, I think creating a culture of recognition will help the team members uh, to know that their hard work and accomplishments are seen and, and being recognized. Um, end of the day, work-life balance, that's very important as we are dealing with changes that happens every day and it helps to have that work-life balance in, in life, right? So it helps to avoid the situation of burnout and cybersecurity, you know, we know that it's very stressful. So work-life balance, that's very important. And of course, most of the cybersecurity professionals, uh, they like to have learning opportunity. That's huge, that's very important. Uh, I think that will help the employee with their career plans. And at the same time, organizations can benefit from their newly learned skills, right? And so it, it helps both parties, right? So in order to attract talent, um, so it's important to advertise job posting properly by including the details about the culture, learning opportunities, work-life balance, et cetera. Do you, Diego? Yeah. No, I agree with you, Nivin. I believe just looking at the question per se, I, I think working from home actually helps on that aspect, right? Especially for cybersecurity professionals, as Nivin was mentioned, sometimes it's very stressful and having that work-life balance is, is really important. Uh, but first of all, you need to, I believe that you need to understand the scope of the work for your employees. If you need to understand if that function you're trying to hire fits in a work from home approach, right? Sometimes you need that person in the office. Um, so it, it's important to have that mapping performed as well. Um, but definitely in order to attract, this is a opportunity, but also, and also I believe uh, opens the, opens the gate, let me put it this way, for you to go beyond of the country, right, boundaries, so you can go externally and, and seek for professionals. I think we see a shortage on professionals here, but definitely there are other countries, such as mine, Brazil, <laughs> with a lot of professionals out there, we can go and hire. I think if we can do this, a kind of remotely work in different nations as well, that is an opportunity for, uh, for us to fulfill those gaps. It's not that we cannot find the professionals, we can find those professions in the market, but they are very expensive because they're working for some other organizations. And unless we have a very attractive package to bring them in, which is a combination of salary, challenge, and work-life balance, it's gonna be super hard for you. So I think in order to attract, you have to get the package, but also we need to think a little bit uh, further than that. So how can we prepare the next generation, right? So how we go to the university, the schools and help to shape and build the new uh, generation of cyber professionals that will be joining the workforce at the entry level. So I think we, we go too much on the marketing, the market trying to hire those people that are ready, but we are forgetting about those that are not there yet and we should be helping to shape them because the demand is there. Uh, but I believe we need to take advantage as well of the automation uh, in our uh, space. There is a lot of automation we can do to minimize the impact of lack of resource. That's a very good perspective, right? Um, maybe find those very difficult roles to fill and see if there's ways that you can leverage automation to scale the workers that you already have. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's the point, right? So it's how can you make your team work smarter? So why do you need 10 people when you can have maybe two in the automation doing all the hard work for them using AI capabilities? Right? I'm not saying that we're gonna re replace all the people, don't, don't get me wrong, but we need to be smart, right? We are not finding professionals. We need so to play with the tools we have in hand. So I, I'd like, uh, Niven, I, I would like to zoom in on something that Diego said um, that the, the changing uh, uh, work from home space that's coming around with COVID has also opened the gate to global recruitment. And I thought maybe I, I'd ask if you had any thoughts about what it means to, uh, to an organization to have the ability to recruit for cyber talent from markets that, that maybe weren't available five years ago, 10 years ago, because people can actually just work from their, their homes. 
Yeah, I think uh, Diego brought a great point. Uh, I think organizations should start exploring that option of hiring people from you know other countries. I know several people who work from you know crews, you know who is traveling all the time, you know for cybersecurity and anybody in IT, they could work from anywhere basically. Uh, so I think it's a great idea to start exploring that path because in the past, maybe we didn't have enough technology to make it happen or nobody believed in those, but you know, at least this pandemic helped us to prove that it's possible or most of the organization were forced to do it even though they never believed in, right? So I think it's good to explore that path and find talents from all over the world. And it's gonna help the organization at the end of the day because uh, it, it's a mixture of talent pool that we are getting. Maybe uh, we don't have enough talent here in, in US and maybe we could hire from other places like Europe or uh, other Asia or other continents, right? So. It just gave me a great idea, Nibby. I should work for my cruise, man. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we have a Airbnb. That's the way to do it. Yeah. As long but as I think we have a. Here. I think we have a very interesting question here on the, on the Q and A. So I about. Well, Dan, yeah. you got you got the last one. Let's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree with the person. So yeah, let's go back to what I just said, right? So we need to invest in next generation of people. So, yeah. I think it's Not a like fifty. It's a 50-50, right? So it's not all about, about the companies per se doing all the investments, but you also need as an employee or as a person, a professional need to invest in yourself as well, right? So what are the gaps you have in your skills uh, that you need to fulfill? Uh, what are the, I don't know, certifications maybe you want to go out and, and seek for, uh, to go, uh, to, to take that help you to shape uh, your profession or your resume and go for the, prof the, the career or to the, uh, the role you're seeking for. Uh, definitely we want to invest in as much as possible for all the US employees, but even investing all the people out there, we still in a shortage amount of people. That is, that is fantastic. Gentlemen, I wanna, I wanna thank you all for taking the time this evening to, uh, to join us here. Uh, I'd like to end uh, with just a little final thought. Um, no one could have predicted how the pandemic has, uh, has touched each of our lives and how it has affected the lives of our family, our coworkers, our colleagues, even the, the things that we do day to day. Um, today, what I've learned is I've learned about improving cyber hygiene. I've learned that ID management is the emerging control plan for cybersecurity. Uh, I've learned that things have changed Sometimes some things for the better, some things for the worse. Uh, I've also learned that if I need to break into uh, into uh, somebody's uh, computer, it should probably be an executive. So I'm going to start there. Thank you for that one. <laughs> um, but overall, uh, I think protecting IT assets and data, responding strategically to the new threat threat landscape, returning to the office bringing talented people into cybersecurity. These are the issues not only of today, of six months from now, of a year from now, but these are the issues of our generation. And I wanna thank you gentlemen for helping us address them today. Absolutely, thank you, Chuck. Absolutely, Chuck. Thank, thank, thank you, Renaldo. Cheers, thank you. Opportunity. Thank you, everyone. So on behalf of CSMP and the Houston chapter, thank you for joining us. Uh, everyone also, uh, all the attendees uh, for this great event. Very, very interesting and great feedback and responses from all of the CISOs. Thank you, everyone, and you have a great rest of the night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, everybody. Good night. And all of you want to hang out for a minute? Yes. Let's see. So what do you think? How did, uh, how did it go? We need to, are we still broadcasting or let me stop my share. Are we still recording? We need to probably stop recording. <laughs>